Biblical humility. Bible describes humility as meekness, lowliness, absence of self. The Greek word translated humility in Colossians chapter 3 verse 12 literally means lowliness of mind. So we see humility is in heart attitude, not an outward demeanor. Biblical humility, the practicing biblical humility. John the Baptist is the greatest example of biblical humility. John said in John chapter 3 verse 30, I must decrease and he must increase. These are the seven great words said by John. John was willing to live the life by the Holy Spirit, cultivating humility. It should be noted that if you feel that he must increase and you do not want to decrease, then that will not work. You must be willing to decrease as he increases his work in you because he uses you and me and lives in you and me. Let us look into Gospel of Matthew chapter 6 verses 9 to 13 is the prayer of the humble emptying himself everything i do is for god's glory not my glory this prayer is a prayer model some people think highly of themselves and some people think lowly of themselves but we need to think for the glory of god's work in us also consider what three of the apostles meant paul Peter and James. Humility is a choice. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 5 to 7. Peter. Humility is a spiritual discipline. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. Paul. Humility is a spiritual protection. James chapter 4 verse 6. James. Humility if practiced is good. It is better than pride. Pride is the downfall of Satan. By being humble, we gain and not lose anything. It brings with it God's blessing. God gives grace to the humble. We are going to see what Peter said. He wrote in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. It is all about his choice. He asks us to clothe on ourselves the humble apron of slavery. Then we are going to see what Paul sees. He says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul says that it is spiritual discipline. Therefore, as the elect of God, the holy beloved, put on therefore in a spiritual discipline. He says about humility. After this, we are going to see what James says in James chapter 4 verse 6. James says that humility is spiritual protection. When we are humble, it protects us from Satan. When we are proud, we are acting like Satan. What if Satan's original sin? What caused his downfall? He was filled with pride, and this brought his fall. Pride is the first sin. It's the worst sin. It is a sin God hates. Do all here know that? We are all struggling with pride. Humility is not thinking little of yourself. It is seeking God in your life. It is thinking of God, but pride is thinking much of oneself. The theme of the Bible is God's glory. Psalms chapter 115 verse 1, Romans chapter 11 verse 36, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31, Philippians chapter 2 verse 11, Revelation chapter 14 verse 7, Revelation chapter 19 verse 1. Here we give glory only to God and to your name be glory. Jesus is co-equal in the Trinity but he is always subordinate to God. He does the will of the Father. So he will bring the universe in subjection to his Father. Matthew chapter 6 verse 13. God's glory is our goal. It's not the theme of the scripture. It should be our goal. We lost our way by wanting our way. It is known as pride. Paul says we are all gone astray. We want our way. It should be God's way. We are designed to bring glory to God. We should give God glory. We fell to sin and lost our way. 
we need to restore the relationship and restore the glory to God. We need to be humble to let God do his work in us. In book of James, it is said, James chapter 4 verse 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud. He does not want our will. He wants his will. He is at war against every manifestation of our pride. God is looking and resisting pride in our life when pride shows up in our life. But the good news is he is constantly waiting to pour out his grace on the humble and we need humility for that. The key to God's attention is humility. Humility promotes spiritual blessings. James chapter 4 verses 6 to 10, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. Salvation is turning to God's way and giving up our ways. That is saving us from impending danger through the blood of Christ and His grace. Our greatest enemy is pride and our greatest friend is humility. Pride is competing with God. Humility is submitting to God. Examine ourselves and remove pride as often as possible. Humility is a choice. James chapter 4 verse 6 to 10. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5. God's grace makes the world offensive to me. And God becomes more and more important than anything in the world. Most of us put God in the second list of our life. No, we need to put God first in our list and life. For this we need humility. We need to be humble first to make God first. Let us turn to Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. God forbids that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It means the world offends me. The world and all of its rebellion against God offends me. This is humility in action in your life. Be clothed with humility. Peter's message, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 5 to 7. Submit yourself and submitting to one another and to the elders the first step in the pathway. It is the spiritual mature attitude. Then it we need to be humble is the second step in the pathway. Humility is now clothed as and is also the pathway to spiritual maturity. Finally, it leads to peacefulness, which is last step in the pathway of spiritual maturity. The key to God's attention is humility. John chapter 3 verse 30. He must decrease, I must decrease is the essence of biblical humility. We must seek to allow Christ to increase in us. It is a choice that Christ should overflow in our life. So how does this happen? Christ will increase when his word is more and more eaten as my food on which I live. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. Christ will increase when his attitudes are reflected in me as I learn from him. Matthew chapter 11 verses 28 to 30. Christ will increase when his actions are empowered through me, so it becomes no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Christ will increase when his compassion is lived out in me. Colossians chapter 3 verse 12. Christ will increase when his priorities are embraced by me. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5. Christ will increase when his will is embraced as my goal. John chapter 6 verse 38. Goal, Christ must increase and I must decrease. Temptation Temptation is not a sin by itself. Falling to temptation is sin. Temptation is trials divinely sent or permitted. Temptation is asking you to cross the God-given boundaries. It is an enticement across the God-given boundaries and to do evil. Temptation is by Satan. And when you make a decision to do temptation, then it is sin. We should not desire to do evil things. Temptation is by thought, imagination, desires, decision. Satan tempts us. The source of temptation is from Satan. 
Satan points beyond the boundaries of God and entices us. He points to our lusts and weaknesses. So when we fall to it, we are alienated from God. Satan wins in his purpose when we fall for it again and again. If we repent and ask God for forgiveness of our sin, by the very repenting and not doing it again, we gain ground. God does not tempt us. God tests us. Since testing is a season, God allows us to be tried not for defeating us, but he brings us to be tempted, to strengthen us, to teach endurance, to build us in faith. Testing is for God's approval. When we overcome temptation, we are made strong in him, but failing to overcome temptation is bad. We do evil in the sight of God. God allows us to be tested so we are able to sustain, endure and victoriously overcome through the trials. He allows it. We resist temptation through the word of God. The thoughts needed to be changed by listening to the word of God, through the Holy Spirit, it does not mean being tempted is sin. Because Satan tempts day and night. He deceives us into it by doing it day and night. He wants to attack a spiritual minded person more and more in attacks. You should become sensitive to sin. He hates God. He wants to destroy his church. Satan attacks believers through temptation. So he tempts us. Temptation can be endured by the best of the saints. They may be tempted to do worse sins. Psalm 1. There is a reward for a person who resisted the temptation. He has a crown of life. Blessed is the man who overcomes it. Where does temptation come from? Temptation comes from Satan. Evil knocks on the door of imagination. You are under its power. Your own desires and your enticing tempts you and brings death. Where does temptation come in general? After a time of great blessing, when we think we are strong, the adversary tempts us and makes us weak. Temptation comes to every person. Devil attacks those a great threat to him. James chapter 1 verses 14 to 15. Where does temptation come from? Temptation comes from Satan. Satan is a deceiver, liar, cheater. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. How does temptation come? The temptation enters to the doorway of mind. It is better to shun the beat rather than struggle in the hook. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 3. Where is the best place to be when temptation comes? The best place to come is to be in the will of God when he bring temptation to us when we are out of this will. Christ was always in the will of the Father. God protects us in various ways. God is putting the edge of protection on us. Satan needs permission from God before he attacks us. What is the primary weapon we should use to resist it? The primary weapon we should use for resisting temptation is prayer, reading the word of God. In prayer, which brings results by the power of the Holy Spirit, we communicate it to God regarding the devil or God knows what we are passing through. He knows what it is. People attempt to cheat, sexual sins, gamble, drink and so on. They do it because of temptation. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 13 to 16. Jesus being high priest, he intercedes regarding Jesus knows everything. He is omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient and holds fast to our confession. We have a high priest who sympathizes with us. No temptation is overcome you, overtaken you, that we are confronted with and fallen. God gives us a control during temptation. God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond your capacity? It is the Holy Spirit inside us that enables us to overcome the power of temptation. We can overcome temptation. It is conquerable. God knows our limitation. He provides us a way to escape route. Satan always does narrow focus of the objective temptation. We lose the big picture by his temptation because he tempts us with the object. Jesus was tempted by Satan. God understands us so well because he has gone through the difficulties. He faced all the testing we go through. He went through all the kinds of testing and categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of the life. So when we go through testing, whatever type it is, 
we can look into Christ for guidance. There are two things to temptation. There are two dimensions to temptation. Spirit allows and Satan tempts. Jesus Christ was led by the Spirit to be tempted and Satan's job was to tempt Christ. Satan was to destroy the people. Satan is like a roaring lion waiting to devour whoever he can. Why did God allow Satan to tempt Christ? We know from the Bible, Adam and Eve were tempted and tested by Satan. The first Adam failed, so the second Adam, who is Christ himself, was allowed by God to be tempted and tested and was allowed and led by the Spirit. And Satan tempted Christ. So if Christ had failed, he would not be our Redeemer. So when we face temptation, we should know God allows it and Satan tempts us. So how are we going to respond in this trying time? Devil wants us to fail and fall and the Spirit of the Lord is waiting and watching to see how we will face it. So we need to be careful that we do not fall and fail. We must be prepared to face him. When Satan tempted Christ, he was physically and mentally tired and exhausted. Satan chose a time when Christ was exhausted and weak to attack him. Satan attacks at vulnerable times. Look how he attacked Job. He removed everything that was close to Job's heart. We know that we are being watched by God and Satan. Satan asks Christ to turn the stones into bread. The devil acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God. He was acknowledged by God himself when he came out of Jordan River after John's baptism. We read that he was declared that he was the Son of God. Satan asked Christ to turn stones to bread. Now we are hungry. Why don't you turn the stones to food? You are the Son of God. Why don't you do it? He is the Son of God. He could do it. But he was 100% human. So he was hungry. So why was he tempted? The few points to it. The lust of the flesh. What is temptation? Why did he resist it? This is a kind of temptation to elevate material needs over spiritual needs. He was in the wilderness 40 days. He was preparing for the spiritual meeting. He was fasting. It was spiritual discipline. So he set himself apart from the world and was having relationships with his father. Here there is a test for a spiritual discipline. We have earthly needs and special needs. We want to know which gets priority in life. Some of the material needs are legitimate needs. God is not against these needs. God wants justice, which is our preference. Is it the spiritual or material needs? Daily devotion time for God. If it is a problem or ignored for the material needs, we need to see the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. We need to resist the temptation and the voice of the devil. We need to be very, very discerning when Christ came into the world. His desire was to please his father. Yes, devil is suggesting Jesus and advising Christ, tempting him. We need to discern the voice of the devil and the voice of God. Devil will take you from God's presence by temptation. Always discern where the temptation is from and what kind of temptation is it. If it's used for spiritual growth and not material things, this is what God needs. Do you see all the miracles done by Christ? Not one miracle was used for his own self. He always uses spiritual power bestowed upon him for God's glory at the cross. Present, if you are the Son of God, save yourself. Jesus himself cannot be tempted. Do you use your God-given ability and spiritual gifts for the glory of God? We should never use virtual resources to serve our ends or our needs. Last of the flesh. When the devil asked Jesus to turn stone into bread, Jesus responded to the devil, People do not live by bread alone, by every word from the mouth of God. Yes, Christ is going through hunger. Devils tempting Christ to turn stone into bread. He was quoting a verse from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3 When we go through trials in desperation, 
of a true character will be displayed whether it is a material desire or a spiritual desire. So listening and hearing Lord's voice is very important and obeying God's commandments is important. We need to be obeying God's will. When Jesus defended against the devil, he renewed that attack in a different angle. When Jesus was victorious in the lust of the flesh, yet Satan tempted him in pride of life. He said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. The devil is tempting Jesus and testing and tempting him. You are the Son of God. Do this daring act in that in front of everyone. Jesus shows to the devil what is capable of. God is there to protect them from every situation. Here devil is using the Old Testament and tempting him with the pride of life. What is the nature of temptation? Why did he do it? This temptation is done not without God's trustworthiness. It is to test God's trustworthiness. The scripture and also says that you must not test your God, your Lord in the Old Testament. You are trying God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. How much do you trust God? You trust his faithfulness. The Lord is able to protect you. Christ is saying you can trust God and resist the devil. It was a temptation to live irresponsibly. Why should Jesus put his life in danger by jumping from the pinnacle? He came to die for us. Jesus knows his father would protect him. If the devil had pushed him down, then father will save him. But he is asked by the devil whether he needs to control. This is a test from God. We are forgiven and there is no condemnation in Christ. Is it right to sin against God? Do you dare to do anything in life that continues to sin? Samuel chapter 19 verse 13 Lord delivers us from the presumptuous sin. When we accept God's forgiveness and grace, that doesn't give us license to sin. Jesus knows God with saving grace, but he is not testing God. This is a kind of temptation to misappropriation of God's word. Used is the word of God. The devil uses the word of God for testing by twisting the scriptures. How are we using God's word? The scriptures. Bible can be used anyway. But the spirit and sense should be according to God's will. Are we taking God's word lightly? Are we twisting God's word accordingly to our whims and fancies? If he was deceived by diverted by the twist in the scripture and the fall came. Now, after making two items in Jesus, Satan tried the third and final one. is making one more attempt to destroy Christ. It's a direct attack. The devil took Jesus to the mountains and showed him the glorious kingdom of earth in its glory. But Christ overcame this and never failed. The last of the eyes. I will give it to you all that you see. You need to bow down and fall before me and worship me. You need to consider me as God. That is all I need. What is the nature of temptation? Why did Jesus resist the temptation? For this kind of temptation, how far did Jesus go in order to avoid the pathway of suffering? He came to establish the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. But devil offered a counterfeit kingdom. He is the prince of the world. So devil knows Christ came to take down the kingdom of devil. God's pathway is different. The pathway wants us not to please the devil. He asks us not to please the devil and take devil's offered kingdom. Therefore, Christ wanted to suffer and take the kingdom of God. Jesus knows one day he will be exalted. The kingdom will be handed to him. By resisting the temptation, he acknowledges to go to the cross. Christ's attitude was to accept the pathway of suffering. Is what Jesus chose. 
their pathway of suffering. The devil's temptation was to deceive him from going to suffering. Most of the time, we want the crown, but not the cross. But Jesus accepted the pathway of suffering to glory because it is the Lord's will. Are we ready to accept the cross? The suffering of Christ is prophesied. Before going to glory, he had to suffer. Devil offered a sh in shortcut a pathway which Christ rejected. But there is a spiritual benefit. And when we go to the pathway of suffering, there are many things we can understand when we go through the pathway of suffering. Normally, we prefer comfort. But when we are tested to strengthen our endurance, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 to 5, endurance develops the strength of character. This is my policies. I want to partake in the suffering of Christ. Because of Christ's pathway of suffering, you are blessed and we are the beneficiary. Christ was willing to obey the Father to do everything. At that point, it was an act. Similarly, we need to wait for God's appointed time. We are impatient in life. We need to wait on the Lord, allowing Him to lift us up. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 It is difficult because we have temptation. It comes up and we need to resist the temptation. When God's appointed time comes, no one can resist him because Lord is sovereign. He knows what he needs to do to lift us. It is temptation to worship God and the world. We need to worship God and serve him. We want God in our side in the best of the world. We cannot serve two masters. Money is a competitor to God. You cannot serve me and mammon. We want the best of our life. Most of us want to serve God and serve the world. Caleb served God wholeheartedly in the Old Testament. If a life is divided in church, we are with God when we go to the world and be with the world. Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life, or is not at all. God hates divided loyalty. He made so many sacrifices for us. I cannot imagine the sacrifices in the cross. He is the God who came and died for me, is what he said in his life. He sacrificed his riches. This points Jesus is the high priest who can understand our weaknesses. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, the three points are that we tend to avoid the pathway. We tend to go ahead of the pathway. We tend to go with God and Mammon. Trials Trial is a suffering that puts strength, patience to faith, to test, Afflictions or temptations that exercise and prove the graces of virtue of men or examining one. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 7 to 8. Joy is gladness and rejoicing in the Lord. Trial is affliction. We need to have a balance between joy in the Lord and trials. Trials are necessary. Trials are purposeful. Trials are temporary. Trials are heavy. Trials are manifold. Trials are under God's sovereignty. There is pain and suffering in trials. In the midst of trials, as believers, we experience joy in the Lord during suffering. We know trials are necessary in the life of believers. Trials are a part and parcel in the life of a believer. We learn obedience to trials. Trials are purposeful. The Savior allows us, takes us through trials to refine us. This refines our faith. Faith is at the very heart of Christian life. We know we are saved by faith and we walk by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Peter compares the refinement of faith with gold. Both are refined by fire. They are tested and proved. When gold is put through fire, we see the purity of gold when melted and poured. When God tests our faith, He does it by putting us through the furnace of affliction. Our faith is refined through the affliction of trials. We need to glorify His name through the trials. So trials are purposeful. Trials are temporary, but our salvation is eternal. Whatever trials we face, when we compare with eternity, this gives us joy because of our faith. Trials are heavy. Trials push down a believer. We will be pressed down by its heavy load. When trials come, it displays the true nature in us. It displays the character in us. Like a grapes being crushed produces wine. So when a believer is crushed, he produces the spiritual nature in him. Trials are distressing when these trials come, it molds us to be a mature 
and serious person. We display these characters to others around us. We learn to deal with it. It brings in us compassion and mercy. Trials are manifold in number. The trials are of different kinds. Trials are under God's control. God is using trials to purify us. We need to be conscious of the trials. He is present in us and knows the trial and is working through us. He is ending trials to recognize it and face it with grace. He wants Christ's likeness in us. God is completely under control. Trials are under God's sovereign control. God is sovereign in all trials in our life and is in control. When we are in the pits of trial, God is with us and in us. He is working through us for his own good. Trials are part of our life. God is in the midst of trials. Conclusion. May God bless these words and keep it in our midst.